Hello everybody, I'm Miss Lisa from Art Tree, and I'm here to tell you about a new series that we are providing, a virtual art series from the Mac. I am recording these classes at home, so I'm not wearing a mask, but I do want to assure you that if I was outside my house teaching, I would be wearing a mask. So what are we going to be doing in this series? I'm going to call this series Woke Art and it runs concurrently with a program that Merced County is running called Read Woke Reading Challenge. And the idea behind this project is that over the months from January through May, we will be learning about different groups and the voices that those groups have. We're hoping that if we all have a chance to express our own voices, that we can come together with a greater appreciation of each other's cultures and values and art. So what do we use art for? One of the reasons we use art is of course to express ourselves. Self-expression is very important, but also we communicate through art. And there are various ways that we communicate. I'm going to be looking at immigrant voices for this first class, January 14th. Um, the video may actually premiere slightly after the 14th, but it is a class on immigrant voices. And we're going to be learning about the Hmong today and about their art form, Pandao. This actually means flower cloth. And I'm using the book, The Spirit Catches You When You Fall Down, by Anne Fademan. This was a book that I read when we first moved to Merced 16, 17 years ago. And it's still just as interesting, even more so now, that I know the places that the book is referring to. Um, somebody had written about this book. Fademan gives us a narrative as compelling as any thriller, a work populated by the large cast of characters who fall in love with Leah. Leah is the mom girl who has epilepsy and the stories about her uh, family, a refugee family from Laos, and how they try to um, get her help. But there is always a very large cultural and obviously language divide between her family and the doctors. Okay, it says this work of passionate advocacy, urging our medical establishment to consider how their immigrant patients conceptualize health and disease. This astonishing book helps us better understand our own culture, even as we learn about another. So let's see what we can learn about the Hmong and the, um, the waves of immigration from Laos. Now, there's, there's still immigration from Laos today, but it was very much um, a large immigration of Hmong after the Vietnam War. So let's take a look at our map here. This is the map that I use for kids' art classes, and we do kids' art once a month, uh, virtual art classes as well. And I like to choose a different uh, location in the world and talk about those people and their work and their art. And hopefully, again, we're trying to learn more about each other so that we can get along better together. So the, the Hmong people originated in China many years ago, southern China, and they were forced into Vietnam and Laos because um, they were restricted in their uh, they wanted to retain their way of living, and that wasn't necessarily possible. So they, um, especially in Laos, they settled in the mountains. There's a very long border between Laos and Vietnam, very mountainous region here. So Vietnam is the turquoise country here. Laos is the dark blue, and Thailand is now next to Laos. Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. And during the Vietnam War, the Americans asked the Hmong and trained the Hmong, helped the Hmong. There is 
a secret alliance that was formed between the Hmong peoples who lived in the mountains and the Americans who were fighting the war in Vietnam. And after the war, uh, the, the common theme was to fight communism. But after the war, there was retribution against the Hmong in Laos because the communist government in North, in North Vietnam wanted to punish the people for aiding the Americans. And so many fled from Laos to Thailand, which is, as you can see, the country next to it. But this was a very um, scary journey and very dangerous. And their farms had been, um, some farms had been burned, others had been bombed. It was very scary time and a very uh, difficult journey to get to Thailand. So in Thailand, and I should say that some of the um, Hmong were actually taken to Thailand by the Americans, but many had to make their own way. And it was a difficult thing to do. At the end of this journey, there's the Mekong River that runs between Thailand and Laos, and they would have to cross the river as well to get to the refugee camps. Pretty scary. Um, again, soldiers could be firing at them as they tried to swim or float across in boats, and, and it was a very scary time for the Hmong people. They settled in the refugee camps uh, temporarily, and after some time were then um, sent to different areas, different countries where they could live. A lot of Hmong came to the U.S., and a lot of them um, settled in the Merced and Southern California area. The farming communities here are similar to the lands that they would have farmed in Laos, except, of course, it's very low to the ground here. It's at sea level, not very much mountainous areas in the valley, but still the soil was conducive to farming. And so a lot of the Hmong families ended up here, and a lot of them had relatives that were here, so more Hmong came to the Merced area. And we actually have a very large and well-established Hmong community in Merced. And what uh, happened at that point was that um, the first wave of immigrants didn't speak a lot of English. Some did. A lot of them didn't. So there was um, a problem of communication, a big problem with communication. And I think a lot of the people never really had a chance to tell others why they were here or how they got here or their harrowing experiences as they escaped from their homelands in Laos. And one of the reasons that um, Storycloth came to be, Storycloth is a very distinctive um, art form in, in the Hmong culture, but Storycloth is actually a narrative in a visual format. So the artists, the Hmong artists, were able to use embroidery to stitch the stories onto cloths of their farmlands in Laos and then their escapes and the soldiers and crossing the river. And it was all very um, visual and good, not just for recording their own history for themselves, but also for future generations of Hmong. Now, um, the traditional patterns of Hmong art are not found in story cloth per se. They are more geometric form, and I should just backtrack a little bit. The Hmong uh, art forms that are really well known are having to do with embroidery. They're more of a textile um, art, and they're very, very skilled uh, in embroidery. The children of Hmong families, the girls especially, would learn to do embroidery from an, a young age, and they had many years to practice. Embroidered art um, made its way into their clothing, and a lot of their 
traditional costumes will have embroidered sashes and collars and all sorts of finery that goes along with their brightly colored um, costumes and traditional clothing, I should say. And some of the motifs that are found in Hmong um, art are passed from generation to generation. And I just want to take a look at a couple of those right now. So this is a motif called elephant foot and it uh, has these four joined spirals and then outlined by one or more of these sort of flower uh, petal patterns. Um, and this was this is a pandal that my mother um, gave me. We are not mom, but she really appreciates this art as well. So this is uh, the elephant foot um, pattern and then put into this piece of artwork. This is done by reverse applique, which means that the top layer of cloth is cut with scissors. So this part was cut like there's a square cut into this one. And there are these zigzag lines. And then there are these curved lines. So everywhere that is cut through the green is then, um, it reveals the red cloth underneath. So this is actually done by cutting through the top layer and then stitching that top layer to the bottom layer so that the bottom layer colors will show through. Now let's take a look at the other side. You can't even see the green stitching. It's so fine. But there's, there's uh, stitching all along these pieces of green fabric. And those stitches are done in green thread. The white, of course, is very much easier to see because it stands out against the red. But there are these little dots also all along, little knots of white within the red. So this is a very intricate um, art form. And you will see a lot of pieces of Pandao made by women who um, retain these traditional motifs. Here are just a couple more that I drew out for you. So this motif here means this is heart and ram's head, house, mountains, leaf frond, and rice seeds, to name just a few. Now what I'm going to do today for the kids art class is I want to show you kids how to do two motifs. I'm going to show you leaf frond, which is this one, and I'm going to show you how to do elephant foot as well, which is this one. I've done it twice here, once with a, um, a pastel, an oil pastel resist technique, and once with a crayon resist. And here the leaf frond is also done once with the oil pastel resist and once with a crayon resist, just so you can see that both kinds of resist techniques work very well. And the reason that I'm doing resist is because if we had chosen to do embroidery, this class would take a long time. The embroidery is very fine with little needles and small um, thin pieces of thread. And it takes a very long time with a very skilled hand and eye to become a master embroiderer. We're going to do uh, watercolor paint over oil pastel or, or wax crayon. And the reason that works well is because the oil in the oil pastel or the wax in the wax crayon will resist the water from the watercolor paints. And so when we paint over this, we don't have to paint in between all of these lines that we just drew. We can just paint right over it and the paint will resist the oil or the 
pastel and you'll see the color coming right through. So to get started, most of I uh, want to work on a square piece of paper and a lot of you will know that Miss Lisa loves to do origami and origami is also done on square pieces of paper. So if you have any origami paper, we can use this. If you don't have origami paper, we can make our own square pieces of paper from a piece of copier paper. So if you take a piece of copier paper and just measure out, six inches is a good, a good size because if you make them too big, it's going to take you a long time to color them in. But you can see exactly how I cut this, this square out of a piece of paper. I just measured six inches by six inches and then drew parallel lines parallel to the edge and this line was parallel to this edge and then I cut out that square. I've got this piece of paper and I've got a piece of origami paper. I think I'll use I'll use the green one. And I'm going to show you how to do these two motifs. Let's start out with leaf frond because it's the easiest one. And then I'll show you a more complicated um, piece, which is the elephant foot. So for leaf frond, let's take a look at what the pattern actually is. It's actually one, two, three, four, five interconnected squares. And we can make them interconnected with the vertical and horizontal lines. As they cross over, they're going to connect the squares together. You can see how it becomes a continuous, um, almost a continuous line. We could trace that line like so. Now when I do origami, I, and uh, this is part of the origami technique, I use fold lines, sometimes as guidelines. Sometimes you fold the paper to be a certain shape and then you continue. Other times you fold the paper and open it back up and where the fold was, it will leave a line, right? And you can use that line as a guideline and make other subsequent folds using that guideline um, to help you. So I'm going to make some guidelines for this drawing here. And I'm going to make, basically, um, we're going to divide the paper in thirds. So one, two, three. We're dividing it into thirds this way. And we're dividing it into thirds this way. One, two, three. So I'm thinking about folding this paper into thirds. So I'm measuring with my, with my mind, I'm measuring this distance here, and I want to make sure that this distance equals roughly this distance. If it measured, if it, if it was exact, that would be even better. Let me just move these out of the way. I'm going to fold this about here because I'm thinking that this distance is equal to that distance, hopefully. And then I can fold it together again. And you can see that wasn't quite right. So I'm going to refold this. Let's try it back there. So now when I fold this, I should be able to find that I folded it pretty much into thirds. So when I open the paper, I've got one, two, three sections. I'll just reinforce those folds. Now I'm going to do the same thing the other direction. I'm going to fold this until this 
distance is about equal to that distance. I'm just eyeballing it, but I think it's about there. And then when I fold this down, I should see that it pretty much meets, and it does. So I can fold that, and I'm going to make those creases strong. Now when I open it up, can you see that there's one, two, three, four guidelines on this piece of square paper? And now I'm going to take, let's do this one in pastel. We could also use crayon, but I find that oil pastel works better because it covers the paper more thoroughly. If you are using crayon instead, and crayon will work, make sure that you press down on your crayon so that you get a good coverage of wax on your paper. And what I'm going to do now is just go over these guidelines. And I'm going to make them wider than that crease line. And you don't need a ruler and you don't need to be exact. Don't worry about it. It doesn't have to be perfectly straight. If you happen to be wearing long sleeves and you are using oil pastels, make sure that you pull your sleeves up so that you don't get pastel in or on your clothes. Okay, so I've got those two lines. Now I'm going to do the remaining two lines. And now I'm going to take the two and two, the four corners, and I'm going to create squares out of these corner pieces. And I'm going to do that by continuing. We've got two sides of the square um, just from doing our horizontal and vertical lines. So we're going to fill in the other two lines in each corner. There's two lines there. One, two lines here, And the last one, one, two. So this is the leaf frond motif. And now if we want to add color to this, we can paint right over this. I'm going to put a little piece of paper underneath. And I'm going to get my paintbrush wet. What color should we put over? I think I'll put red over this one. So I'm going to get my watercolor paints. And I'm going to start by resuspending. Let me put this down here. I have to start by resuspending the pigment. For those of you that have had me teach you before, you know that we have to resuspend the solid pigment by putting some water into the pan of paint and going round and round and round with our brush. 
and now we have quite a lot of paint on our brush, we can just paint right over this pattern. I'm painting right over the green, but because that green is an oil pastel, the paint won't stick. Now this does not work with soft pastels. Soft pastels, or you might call them chalk pastels, do not have oil in them, so you won't be able to get the same effect. I would recommend crayons if you don't have oil pastels, because crayons have wax in them and that does the same thing as far as repelling the water in the paint. So you see how the motif stands out really nicely. We've got three more, uh, three more squares to go. One. Okay, so there's the first motif that we've learned. Leaf frond done with green oil pastel and red watercolor paint. Now, if I wanted to, I could actually blot that little bit of red off of that with a tissue. It doesn't really bother me, but if that bothers you, you can just take a tissue and remove any bits of extra paint. Okay, now we're going to be learning how to do the elephant foot motif. And this one is much more complicated. I think I have a way to be able to teach it to you. Um, so if you are a young child, this might not be the one you want to try. I think uh, leaf frond is very good for younger children. For older children or those that want a little bit of a challenge, we're going to do elephant foot, sometimes called elephant footprint but mostly I think it's called elephant foot from what I've seen. So I'm going to take a piece of paper. Let me use green this time. Again, this is a piece of origami paper, but if you don't have origami paper, you can cut yourself a six inch square and go from there. And I think I think actually I'm going to use a different color because the one I've chosen doesn't show up very well on my map. So I've got yellow and I'm going to start by change of mind. I'm going to use gray. So I'm going to start by making some guidelines again. I'm going to be folding guidelines and the reason I like origami paper too is because it's white on one side and it has a color on the other. It's very useful for folding origami because you can tell if you're doing it correctly or not by how much of which color is showing at each step. That's kind of a little um, trick that you might not know about. But also good for teaching purposes um, and doing other things where square papers is required. So I'm going to be showing you now how to make some guidelines with this piece of gray paper. I'm going to start by folding corner to corner across the paper. And just like folding origami, you want to make these guidelines as precise as possible. One way to do that is to hold the corners together and pull down like this and then crease. So let me do that again. I'm going to fold across corner to corner, fold the paper down to the table and then pull down to get the crease. I'm also going to want to fold across the paper this direction. Okay. 
and open it up. And then fold across the paper in the opposite direction. So let's open this up and see what we have. Now, instead of nine squares like leaf frond, we have eight triangles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they all meet at this point in the center. And with, this, uh, with these guidelines, we're going to be able to make these different sections here. Can you see how these triangles kind of correspond to these triangles. The difference being we have to make some little marks here um, to fold the paper back so that we can get the curves in the right place. So this is how I figured out we can do that. We're going to take the distance between our fold line and the corner and we're going to, you don't have to measure it exactly, but kind of eyeball that distance. Now I'm going to go from this corner to this corner and I'm going to go halfway along and eyeball the distance. I just realize I have two pieces of paper there. Go from now this crease to the corner, eyeball the distance about there. Now from the corner to this crease halfway across is about there. And now from this crease to the corner is about there. And from the corner to this crease is about there. And again, I'm going halfway from here to here and marking the distance. Halfway from here to here and marking that distance. Halfway from here to here about here and marking the distance. Now what I'm going to do is basically think about this line from dot to dot and I'm going to fold the paper from dot to dot and I'm going to do that for each of the four corners from dot to dot Let me turn it this way so you can see what I'm doing. Dot to dot, fold it under. You can see that that needs to come up just a little bit more. Dot to dot and fold it under. Dot to dot and fold it under. And the last one, dot to dot and fold it under. So now we have this. And now what we're going to do is we're going to mark about maybe three-eighths of an inch away from the edge. Maybe you could probably do a quarter of an inch too. At, on each of these uh, guidelines that we folded, we're going to come in and mark a distance of about three-eighths of an inch a quarter of an inch, it doesn't matter. Just make it kind of consistent. So that you can see on this fold line, I've marked this dot here and this dot here. On this fold line, I've marked this dot here and this dot here and all the way around. Okay, now what we're going to do is we are going to start at this dot, wherever you want, start at that dot, and you're going to come up. We're going to make a spiral and come down. Oh, well, let me go back. This is where Andrew has to reverse. Okay, 
So we're going to look at what we've got here and we are going to see, we're going to turn this so that we've got a flat edge on the top and a flat edge on the bottom. So not, not a pointy edge. If I turned it this way, we'd have a pointy edge and a pointy edge. But you want the flat edge on the top and the flat edge on the bottom from how you're looking at the paper. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, from the dot, go up and down. And then we're going to go up and around like a spiral. And we're going to come back to that center and we're going to go up and almost to that guideline and around like a spiral. So it's like you have some mirror image, right? You've got a mirror and you're seeing the spiral going one direction and you're seeing the spiral going the other direction. Okay, so we'll turn it 90 degrees and we're going to do from the center up and down to the next dot and we're going to go up and down to the next dot. And I'm trying to keep these pretty much on the edge of the paper as I go. And then we're going to come down about 3 eighths of an inch again. And we're going to go, we're going to make a spiral. So we're going up and around almost to that guideline. And around and around and around. We're going to go from this that dot up. This is the mirror image, so we have to go the other direction. And we're going to go up and down, up and down. And then we're going to go that same distance again, about three-eighths of an inch, and we're going to go up to the guideline and around into a spiral. We're going to go up to the guideline and around in a spiral the other direction. Okay, so when you come down here, we almost touch, but not quite. We almost, the, the circle, the uh, spirals almost touch each other but they don't quite, so leave a little bit of space between them. Let's do the last one here. So we're here and we're going to go up, almost to the edge and down. We're going to go up, almost to the edge and down. And then from, we're going to go from this distance, we're going to make that same distance again, drop it down, and we're going to go up and around into a spiral. We're going to do one on the other side, going the other direction. We're going to go up and around into a spiral. So there we have it. This one, I might just alter it just a tiny bit to make it bigger. It's okay because when I come back with the oil pastel, it will kind of cover up some of these places that I modified. For this one, I'm going to use this super blue color. This again is an oil pastel, and I'm going to start with the spirals. One thing about using oil pastel is you try to think of ways where you won't be dragging your hand through the pastel if possible. So I don't want to go around the edges, all the way around the edges first, because then I'm going to be smearing the pastel when I do these spirals. I'm going to start with the spirals and then go to the, the edging.
And again, this doesn't have to be perfect. As you're doing this, just think about how much more difficult it would be to be doing this by cutting the fabric and using tiny little stitches to make these beautiful shapes. Oops, that one went off a little bit. That's okay. And now at this point, I can go ahead and do the kind of flower pattern that goes around the outside. So there we have it, a nice elephant foot pattern. And now I'm going to put some color on, let me put it over here. Now I'm going to put some color on this as well. So what will look good with that blue? I think I'm going to use orange with this one. I'm going to resuspend the paint round and round and round. You may have noticed that we have a lot of videos on our YouTube channel. And I use this technique of crayon resist and oil pastel resist quite often in children's classes because we're able to get a lot done in a shorter period of time. And the uh, colors always turn out so beautifully. It's much easier to paint over the blue and have the blue stay put than to have blue paint and then paint the orange color in between the blue. For parents, this is a, a nice technique because the kids won't get frustrated when the blue paint mixes with the orange paint because it wasn't completely dry. In this case, we're using a dry medium, which is the pastel, and painting right over it with the wet medium, which is the paint, and the pastel stays where it's supposed to, and the paint goes everywhere else. So there we go. That's 
a little bit wet to hold up, but we can hold up our leaf frond. And I'll see if I can hold this up briefly. It's still really wet. Oh, I was going to open up these corners and continue the painting. I forgot about that. <clears throat> Now these traditional patterns are often found somewhere in the clothing, so they might be incorporated into a sash or a collar or any number of places on the traditional clothing. They're also um, found uh, in other areas of Hmong art, perhaps on pillows or baby carriers, lots and lots of embroidery. So here we go. Here is our elephant foot. I hope you enjoyed that. This is our children's class coming to a conclusion. For the adult class, I'm going to be taking a look at the technique of collage, and we're going to be talking somewhat about the Hmong story cloths and how we can use the idea of a story cloth to make a story about somebody that we know. Okay, I'll see you then. Goodbye.